Right. This uh, talk is based on a book that I, I published through Cambridge University Press uh, in the Indigenous Knowledge Library series called Traditional Fishing Methods of Africa. And my interest in, in traditional fishing methods started um, when I was based at Lake Sabai Research Station in Northern Zillaland uh, in the late 60s and 70s. But prior to that, I chosen when I was doing my BSc, uh, I chosen to take an arts major and that was social anthropology in addition to zoology and other science subjects. So I've always had an interest in social anthropology and being based in Zillaland and, and going on trips into Mozambique and, and elsewhere um, further and further into Africa, I became increasingly interested in traditional fishing methods. And here you can see my assistant, Nelson and Bletcher, who worked with me for six and a half years at Lake Sabaya. And between us, we constructed a series of long lines that I, I used to catch the air breathing catfish. Because in those rather primitive days, you made your own equipment, you didn't buy it, um, and you didn't find it on, on a computer. So we made our own long lines and we created a very quantitative way of sampling uh, air breathing catfish. And there's the catfish top right, very handsome fellow. And uh, my research on the catfish, which is distributed all the way up uh, Eastern Africa into North Africa and Eastern, even Eastern Europe, uh, took me to many countries, including Botswana, and there the lower two pictures are Lake and Gami. But also, wherever I went, and somewhat to the regret of my wife, I always chose to go on holiday to places have, that have interesting traditional fishing methods. And uh, one of them was Zanzibar in, in Tanzania. And there you can see some shots um, of me active there. I hired a bicycle and rode the length and breadth of Zanzibar looking for traditional methods. And also during my trips in Africa, um, I tried my best to visit as many fish markets as possible. Here's one in Kasumu in Kenya on Lake Victoria. And to examine the fishermen's catches using the different gear. And of course, to go uh, and look at, at what they're selling. And uh, this is in Stone Town in, in Zanzibar. In top left, you can see that unfortunately, they're also selling uh, some crayfish that are in berry, in other words, carrying eggs, which is strictly illegal. Now, I'm not going to go too much into statistics, but Africa is a huge continent, over 30,000 kilometer marine um, coastline. Uh, the longest river in the Nile, the second largest lake in terms of surface, surface area after Lake Superior, and that is Lake Victoria, and the other great African Great Lakes, and very extensive wetlands, estuaries, and estuarine systems. So it is extremely well um, equipped to, to um, provide habitat for aquatic organisms. Now, this uh, diagram shows the contribution of fishing to the GDP uh, of different African countries. And inland fisheries are indicated by the green circles. And you can see that um, in East, Central and, and West Africa, a lot of countries are, are quite a considerable part of their GDP derives from inland fishing. And in, in East Africa and also in West Africa, quite high from marine artisanal fishing. Now, in general, artisanal, small-scale, traditional fisheries, whatever you call them, are largely ignored, despite the fact that they yield about two-thirds of the global uh, catch of aquatic organisms, both fish and, and shellfish. They're an incredibly important source of animal protein, especially to rural people, and in Africa provide food security for over 200 million people. And there are about 10 million involved in after catch activities, of whom 27% of women are women. So, you know, they are a staple in the diet of many people, but they're also a safety net in terms of, of scarcity. It's therefore incredibly important uh, that we conserve them. Now, I'll be dealing mainly with bony fishes and cartilaginous fishes, but I will be dealing a little bit with invertebrates. And obviously, they are extensively collected, not necessarily for eating, but to sell a tour to tourists, as shown here. A very wide range of fish species, literally thousands, are caught uh, using traditional fishing methods in Africa. 
Um, here are, are some examples of typical freshwater fishes that are caught uh, mainly in, in, uh, in Southern Africa. And here are some examples, some additional freshwater fishes and marine fishes. Uh, but it would be impossible to show you the full range. It is incredibly extensive. If we look at a quick history, the his history of traditional fishing in Africa, we can divide it into the following, the prehistoric era, Egypt, and just about all the firsts happened in Egypt, and the pre-colonial era, uh, which was a, a very important era in, era in terms of um, innovation, the colonial era, post-colonial, and then modern. And it's important to realize that fishing methods are divided into two main categories. Passive gear, which stays in one place and the fishes kind of swim into it and get caught or killed in some other way. And then active gear, which is actively moved through the water in order to snare the fishes in one way or another. And I'm not going to be able to deal with all of those, but there you can see the wide range of passive and active uh, gear uh, that feature in traditional fishing methods. Now, of course, we must remember that human fishermen and women are competing with nature's fishermen. Uh, there we can see the classic black heron creating a shadow to allow to catch fish, a, a goliath heron uh, eating a snake catfish, uh, Thalassius, the fish-eating spider, which is found up in northern Zuland, and various eagles that also catch fishes. A point I'd like to make is that one of the reasons why traditional fishermen are so successful is that they have an incredible knowledge of the behavior, the biology and the ecology, habitat preferences and dial and seasonal uh, patterns of the fishes they're catching. And that's what makes them so efficient and also to harvest, makes them able to harvest resources sustainably. These are photographs I took of this morning run of the sharp toothed catfish in Lake Sabaya. And I was the first scientist to document those spawning runs in detail. But what amazed me is when I talked to African fishermen, they knew all this already. They could tell me about much more about the spawning runs of catfish than I had discovered through my own research. Now, harvesting of aquatic organisms, including plants, starts at a very basic level. For instance, harvesting water lily bulbs by hand. Uh, foraging for scallops and in the in the beach at Paje and in Zanzibar, and even catching coconut crabs, somewhat hazardous, uh, but it can be done uh, by hand. Poisoning is a very common method of um, capturing fishes for consumption in Africa, and the poisons that are used are biodegradable poisons that disappear after a while, and in general the fishes can be eaten uh, without poisoning the, the eater. And uh, in my book I detail a, a large number of plants that are used as fish poisons, euphorbias, uh, the fish poison bean, the leaves, branches, roots, and seed spot pods, uh, the tambuti tree, uh, seeds from the coral tree, except from the milk bush, uh, the physic nut tree, the impala lily, African dream herb, violet tree, all uh, provide um, material for fish poisons that, that are biodegradable, and the beach poison vine, and also the torchwood. So that's an ancient method that has been used and I believe can be used sustainably by people who know what they're doing and know what concentrations to use. But as I'll point out later, there are other poisons which are absolutely deadly uh, and which have a lasting effect which should not be used. Now moving on at the scale of sophistication, the tidal fish traps that still buy and in many other places along our coastline um, are remarkable examples of early uh, fishing devices. And basically it, it works by uh, creating these arcs of rocks at high tide, the water and the fish go over the top and at low tide, the fishes get stranded and they can be caught using hand nets or, or spears. Now there's a controversy in the, in the Southern Cape um, as to you know, whether these fish traps should, uh, people should be allowed to continue to use them. I think uh, they should be allowed to continue to use them, but the authorities have decided otherwise. So in most of the cases, there, there are gaps in the traps to allow the fish to escape. And interestingly, um, 
these fish traps that, that uh, take into account changing water levels have also been established in freshwater environments. And this is one recently established below the, uh, the dam wall, the Van der Kloof dam wall on the, Orange, on the Orange River. And when the water comes out of the dam and then floods over the rocks, uh, yellowfish and other fishes are, are um, stimulated to migrate upstream and they get caught when the water is high. And we've since found that, in fact, um, traditional fishermen in the Okavango also created these kind of tidal traps. This is another example. Uh, uh, this is at Pajay in Zanzibar of artificial reefs created using coral rock and, and mollusk shells. And this is low tide, the water is drained away. Uh, but at high tide, uh, a lot of fish congregate around there and people are able to catch them using nets. Another device, and this is a, a diagram of a modern version of it, are fish aggregation devices, uh, which uh, this one floats on the water surface and has uh, steamers hanging down, which congregate fish, and then you're able to catch them with lift gear, purse seines, and, and other gear. And amazingly, the dolos invented in South Africa for harbor protection, that is now being used all over the world, including in Algoa Bay, uh, to make um, um, substrate-based um, uh, fish aggregation devices where fish and shellfish congregate and can more easily be caught. Moving on to spears, you'll always recognize a fishing spear by having a serrated head of some kind. Uh, so it, it sticks in the fish and the fish can't wiggle out. And these have been used um, right from the very early days of, of human uh, hominids in, in South Africa by koi sand fishermen, by the early strunt bloopers. And there's evidence in the over 3,000 middens along the South African coastline, which are basically uh, the kitchen debris. Uh, we can identify the different fishes and shellfishes that were collected and eaten by these people. And by the way, these aren't only, this is an ocean kitchen debris, it's also the debris from the first technology hubs in South Africa, where different kinds of tools made from bones and shells and wood, and then later from metal uh, can be found. There are many cave paintings uh, in Southern Africa that show that the use of spears from boats has been employed for at least 35,000 years um, locally. And um, in Egypt, where a lot of things started, he has a, a, a painting in a tomb of spearing Nile tilapia um, from um, boats. Here's an example of the very light spears that he used in the upper Zambezi uh, for spearing catfish, which um, can be speared at night in shallow water on their spawning runs uh, or in, in shallow wetlands. And there's a spear fisherman with his bicycle, bicycle taking his catch back um, to town uh, near Pajay in the Zanzibar. Now, this is a very unusual uh, spear fishing method, and sadly, it's gone extinct. It's called the dark hut or Obulu fishing method, and it was used by the Twa people on the Kafui Flats uh, in Zambia. And they created this floating hut or, or hut on the edge of the river. Um, and it was constructed in such a way that they could clearly see the fish swimming past and they would thrust this long spear up to six meters long and, and make very good catches. Um, one uh, fisherman who was interviewed said he regularly um, speared 80 fish a day and sometimes up to 200 fish. Uh, sadly, this method has completely disappeared, despite the fact that in the 1950s, a, a colonial fisheries officer, McClare, uh, recorded over 250 dark huts um, along the uh, Kafui floodplain. So it's, it's very sad to know that this innovative method is no longer with us. Fishing bows and arrows are used in some parts of Africa, uh, for instance, the Kavango River uh, in Caprivi, and in uh, some parts of West Africa, but they're much more commonly used in South America and in Southeast Asia. Um, gaffs are, are also a simple way of catching um, aquatic life. Here's a, a fellow who's caught an octopus um, off um, Zanzibar. And here's another uh, interesting one. It's a gaff with a trigger mechanism that allows the, the hook to be pulled uh, forwards in order to um, hook uh, fishes out of wetlands. 
Now, moving on to fishing rods, uh, pole fishing, uh, that is fishing with a rod a line uh, without a reel. It's been practiced in ancient Egypt for at least 4,000 years. And on the right, I've shown a photograph of a homemade fishing rod that I found at Villanculos, made by a young man um, in, in Mozambique, entirely from, except for the reel, the three-pointed reel, everything was from the uh, Ilala palm. Here's uh, an, another example, pole fishing in the cozy estuary. And there are many innovations surrounding uh, fishing rods. Uh, this is a fishing rod with a, a rattle, a dried gourd, uh, a rattle so that you stick the rod in the ground and when the fish bites the the gourd rattles. Our fishing hooks are obviously an important part of the uh, an angling gear and they've been known in Africa for tens of thousands of years. Originally a uh, natural um, hook such as the claws and beaks of, of eagles uh, as well as thorns of various kinds, and even the, the, the horn of a rhinoceros beetle and uh, porcupine quills were used either as hooks or um, as gorges. A uh, gorge on the bottom right is something that uh, was, is, is tied to the line, put in the bait, and when the fish follows it, it opens up and, and straddles the gullet and then uh, therefore captures the fish. In the top, you can see the kind of hooks that are made from the, the spines on uh, the Ilala palm uh, up in northern Zuland and Mozambique. Now, these are examples of very complex compound hooks uh, that are found in the Pacific Islands, and I've searched for them all over Africa, and the only place we found them is in, Mod Mozamb uh, sorry, in Madagascar, which of course has links with uh, the Pacific Islanders. So these um, elaborate hooks are not found locally. Um, and what, what is found locally are, are metal hooks. And what's interesting is that very early in, in the fishing history in, in Egypt, uh, hooks with eyes and barbs um, were, were made. Right, let's move on to fish traps. Uh, the simplest kind are these sort of uh, hollow tunnel traps uh, made from bark shown top left. And uh, what interests me is that the kind of traditional fishing methods I found in Africa are replicated in many other parts of the world. And on the right, you can see similar hollow bark traps uh, from China. These are constriction traps that are made specifically to catch one species of fish, and that's the snake catfish, Clarice theodori. Uh, it's used up in Caprivi in the Kavango uh, system. And a constriction trap is basically a tubular track um, which doesn't have a valve in it to uh, allow the fish, to prevent the fish from escaping. The fish are held in the trap by water flow. So there you can see a larger version of a constriction trap. There's no valve at the entrance. The, uh, it's always put in a flowing river and um, they can get very large. Here's an even longer one from uh, Mozambique. And they typically put in these structures um, in a flowing river, the fish are, are washed in, and they tend to control their own catch because when the trap gets full, uh, no more fishes can go into it. Uh, their famous uh, giant constriction uh, uh, traps on the K uh, Congo River in, in uh, near Malepo Pool. Uh, and there you can see the very fast running rapids and the hazardous conditions that these uh, fishermen are, are having to endure. Looking at other kinds of fish traps, these are the valve traps, or mono traps. And you can see that um, a, a valve has been created that allows the fish to swim in, but it makes it very difficult for them to swim out. And they take various forms, as you can see here from Liberia, uh, from the upper Zambezi, um, um, and also from uh, Malawi, Mozambique. And just taking a closer look at that valve, you can see how beautifully uh, made it is. And this is one of the crafts that I think is so important for us to conserve and not be replaced by monofilament gill nets. It's a, it's a work of art, but it's also something that catches food. And there you can see again the magnificent artwork and craft work in making these valve baskets. And that's the other end of the basket, the part that can be opened up uh, to take the catch out. Uh, on the left is an uh, exquisitely made and Buna valve trap from Lake Malawi. 
Lake Malawi is a, a remarkable lake. Um, over 95% of the fishes there come from one family, the Cyclidae, and most of those are uh, Mbuna. There are over 800 fish species in Lake Malawi, and they, they caught not only to eat, but also for the ornamental fish trade. And then on the right, you can see a slightly different valve trap with the entry on top instead of on the end uh, from the Congo River. And these are very well known uh, fish traps all the way up the east coast of Africa and also in west and northwest Africa, the Madeira trap. And uh, an interesting feature of them is some of them are made in, so that they're collapsible and they're easy to stack and to, to take back and forth on the boat. But then when you deploy them, you open them up. And they're used uh, for catching both uh, bony fish and shellfish, so crabs and crayfish, as well as bony fish um, can be caught in them. Another kind of uh, fish trap is a fish pot uh, where the uh, fish uh, enter a valve uh, at the top. And uh, these, the ones in the main picture are from the uh, Kafui River. But interestingly, in Bahrain, I, I found uh, almost identical fish pots uh, being used there. Here's another interesting innovation on the, on the valve trap, and that is a movable valve trap. It's a kind of a reed fence that you can fold in different ways to create the valve and also to create barriers on either side. And then you put this facing upstream and uh, take your catch. And then at the end of the fishing uh, period, you, you can fold it up and take it away again. Now, some of the most famous traditional uh, fishing methods in the world are the barricade fish traps at Cozy Bay, up in the extreme northeastern corner of uh, Zululand. And there you can clearly see how they have a, a pattern which guides the fish around a, a semicircle and into the uh, trap at the end. The, that's what the trap at the end looks like. It's got a mono valve basket, and then the fish get into that circular uh, barricade and uh, they can then be caught with hand nets or spears. And the most common fish caught at Cozy are spotted grunter, flathead, head mullet, river bream, natal stump nose, and purse mouths, as found by uh, Scotty Kyle, uh, who spent nearly 30 years uh, working in that area. And once again, this is a, a, a similar sort of a design from the Philippines, but these are uh, fish traps made out of walls of stone but with a similar design uh, to those at Cozy Bay. Now, moving on to fishing baskets and fishing nets. Uh, this is a, a, a rock engraving from a tomb in Saqqara in Egypt, um, showing a, a lift basket being used some four and a half thousand years ago. And here are examples of a push basket. It's something you push in front of you, or you can also pull it uh, using the upper Zambezi in shallow uh, wetlands. Uh, mainly to catch smaller uh, uh, fish for, for stews. And there's another kind of uh, uh, push and pull basket, and Bukushu, uh, which is used in the upper parts of the, the permanent swamp in, in the Okavango Delta in Botswana. This is another kind of fishing basket, the Isifonia thrust basket. And it's got a hole on top and you hold that hole with your hand and you thrust the basket downwards and then you put your arm through the hole and, and remove the fish. And this is famously used on the Pongola River floodplain up in um, Maputo land. And back in Kentinli's day, when he was researching there, up to 800 people used to participate in these Isiponia drives. And they were the major event of, of the uh, community event of the year. So they, they were a social gathering, a spiritual gathering, in fact, as well as a, a food yielding uh, operation. And when I lived up in Lake Sabaya, I had the privilege of participating in some of these Fonia fish drives. They're quite hazardous because there are also crocodiles and hippos in, in the floodplain. There are also lots of thorns um, and there are, are uh, leeches which stick onto you. Uh, they're tiger fish, uh, but it's great fun. The sad thing though, and you have a close up of a Fonia fish drive, is that from 800 people, 
it, these fonia fish drives are now reduced to just a few dozen people. And sadly, I predict that within 10 years, the fonia fish drives will go extinct and that whole traditional fishing method and all the craftsmanship associated with it uh, will disappear forever unless we do something active uh, to maintain it. And an interesting example that I can give is that in Japan, they have a traditional fishery based on cormorants, where ringed cormorants go out and catch fish and bring them back to the fishermen. Now, this method of catching food has it doesn't exist anymore in the commercial sense. It's only performed for tourists. And although it's it's a second, very much a second choice, you know, even if we promote a kept uh, Isifonia drives going on the Pongola River in order to generate income for local people from tourism, I think it's worth preserving uh, this method in that way. And there you can see a typical catch, largely a, a sharp toothed catfish, but also labios and squeakers and, and all sorts of things. Our thrust baskets take different forms in different parts of Africa. Here's the upper Zambezi, um, in the Caprivi area. Uh, they they uh, have a different kind of thrust basket where you put your, your arm in the side of it. And there you can see uh, these different designs of thrust baskets uh, from different parts of Africa. Now let's move on to nets. Uh, there are depictions of nets in, in early in ancient Egypt uh, going back thousands of years. He has a lift net being uh, deployed um, between two papyrus rafts. And uh, in Europe, uh, fishing with nets has been recorded back uh, to the 14th century. And it's certainly been going on in Africa uh, since then and probably long before then. There are many different kinds of nets. These are triangular lift nets used in Mali. And there you can see very similar ones from Samoa. There's a larger triangular lift net uh, being used in rapids in the Congo River, very similar ones from Tokelau. And there's a massive communal triangular fish netting um, operation going on um, in the Congo. And these, these sort of uh, communal um, events take part place in, when water levels are receding in endoreic lakes and in floodplains, which the people know will dry out. So there's, there's no reason why they shouldn't harvest the fish to exhaustion uh, because uh, those fish are probably going to die um, anyway. Uh, he has uh, an early painting, some 3,000 plus years before present, of what looks like a purse sein in Egypt. Um, and sein nets and gill nets are, are widely used in Africa. This is a, a um, one where the uh, top lines and bottom lines have been made from natural fiber and uh, the net weights are, are rocks. Um, on top left is a natural rock net weight that I found at Hans Bayer. And then bottom right, you can see the wood uh, floats from a low field chestnut tree. And this is the typical sort of hybrid technology where a um, commercially bought um, net has been uh, uh, used with coral rock um, as, as uh, the weights. But the big problem we have in Africa at the moment with nets is the multi-filament nets that we've previously used, which are reasonably visible to the fishes underwater and not um, super efficient, have now been replaced by monofilament gill nets, which are almost invisible, extremely efficient, and uh, they not only use uh, static gill nets, but they also use seine nets and they also use to line traps. And this is probably the biggest problem that African fisheries are facing now in that migrant fishermen who have no vested interest in the long-term sustainable use of resource come in with these deadly fish uh, monofilament gill nets, totally decimate the resource and then move on to another place and the locals suffer. And these are examples of giant monofilament gill nets are found at Kizumkazi in, um, in Zanzibar. Um, they are illegal, but they're openly um, being used and, and deployed. And they're not only used in the traditional way, here's another way in which they're used in that they encircle a reef, and then the fishermen go in um, with spears and other means uh, to collect the fish that have been accumulated there. Now, some countries in Africa have banned the use of gill, monofilament gill nets under some circumstances. 
And as in a lot of uh, conservation initiatives, Kenya has taken the lead. Kenya's banned plastic bags, and they've also banned the use of gill nets under many circumstances. And there, a lower picture shows confiscated illegal gill nets, but they are still being extensively used. And another problem is the use of mosquito nets as sane nets. Uh, as you know, foreign aid organizations, including Bill Gates, um, have poured millions into buying people mosquito nets to protect them from malaria. But very few of these nets are actually hung over beds. They use to catch fishes. And because they're impregnated with insecticide, they release that insecticide into the water. And because they have such a fine mesh, they catch absolutely everything, including the eggs and larvae of fish and shellfish. Uh, this is another example of that sort of thing. This is actually a piece of fabric that uh, would be made into clothing, but it's being used for intertidal um, foraging in Zanzibar. Interestingly, there are also examples uh, from the literature of the use of animals to catch fishes. For instance, in Madagascar, it's been recorded that suckerfish um, have been used to catch turtles. Um, in the Cape Verde Islands and elsewhere off the northwest coast of Africa, um, dolphins have been, uh, her, uh, shoals of dolphins have been used to herd fishes into shallow water. And the, the cormorant fishing method that's currently still used in Japan was previously also uh, found in uh, Madagascar, but we found no recent evidence of it still being used. Our traditional fish processing methods are also worth studying and preserving. And there are many different ways in which fish are processed, uh, fried, grilled, sun-dried, smoked, curried, et cetera. And there you can see a, a sort of lungfish kebab. Here is an example of how mud fishes are, are smoked um, in a basket covered over, over a, a, a cool um, fire. Um, and the smoke is what does the uh, preservation. Curried labia, absolutely delicious, curried with uh, onions. Uh, this is from the uh, upper swamp in Okavango. And here in Mozambique, on Pomeni Esri, a fellow who's um, drying flag tails that he's uh, caught. Uh, so sun drying is very important. And on the left there, diced catfish, salted and sun dried, and then a smoked kebab over a cool fire on the right. Now, the reason why I say that the way in which fish are, are, are cooked and preserved is important is this, this example from Lake Victoria. On the top, you can see uh, images of the endemic cichlids, which are relatively small species, but very large numbers of them, and they form the basis of the traditional fishery. Then the Nile perch was introduced into Lake um, Victoria. It's absolutely decimated the cichlid population. And of course, in order to dry and smoke and cook Nile perch, you need much bigger and hotter fires than you need for the little cichlids. So the, the, one of the uh, unfortunate byproducts of the introduction of the Nile perch is that trees have been chopped down um, all around Lake Victoria in order to create the bigger fires needed to cook and, and, and smoke them. Uh, so that has been an unseen consequence of that very unfortunate introduction. Right, of course, you also need boats to go fishing. So let's have a look at that. Uh, this is an arts impression of papyrus raft fishing boats that were used in ancient Egypt. Um, and they're still used in, in Africa today. In Northern Africa, you, in Egypt, you find uh, crude papyrus rafts as shown there. And then uh, at Cozy Bay in Lake Nschlange, you can see the um, the raffia palm uh, front uh, rafts and uh, on parts of the Zambezi River, the old log raft is still in use. Bark canoes, uh, such as this one on the Musapa River in Mozambique, can also still be found, but they're now becoming increasingly rare. Uh, the more traditional Galawa or dugout canoe, it's uh, as shown here uh, on the Chobi River in, in, in Caprivi beautifully designed um, and, and carved out um, Makoros. And here's uh, other examples uh, from a Zimbawera, which is a temporary uh, floating fishing uh, village or, or shack um, on Lake Chilwe in, in Malawi. 
And these people spend five to six months of the year uh, at the Zimbabweras fishing uh, Lake Malawi using their dugouts and, uh, and also wooden boats. And then the rest of the year they spend back in their villages on dry land. And a similar situation exists, for instance, in Peru. This is a floating fishing village on the Itaya River uh, where people spend part of the year. Now, of course, dugout canoes require large trees, and large trees are become, uh, becoming increasingly rare in many parts of Africa. For instance, Grand Comor and the Comores, there are no large trees left, and they're having to harvest trees from the more forested islands of Moheli uh, and Anjouan. Um, in Mozambique, they're running out of trees, as is the case in the Central African Republic and in Zanzibar. So one of the solutions to that found in Botswana is that fiberglass replica galawas have been made. They look and behave uh, very in a very similar way. And I think this is a, a great example of the kind of modern technology solution that can be found um, to the crisis of uh, there not being enough large trees. And how is this for innovation? A, a, a fisherman in Northern Angola, uh, he found the wingtip fuel tank of an F-84 Thunderjet and uh, carved a, a hole in the top, and he uses this rather precarious um, structure uh, to go fishing. Now, the more sophisticated um, dugouts um, up the east coast of Africa and the Western Indian Ocean Islands look like this. This is at Kizimkazi. Uh, it's got double outriggers, and it can take um, a sail as well. And these are the double outriggers that are used um, off the Comores. I've been out on them and uh, with the fishermen uh, with just a few hundred meters from shore, you're over water 800 meters deep. And these are the um, double outriggers that they used uh, mainly targeting oil fish and then catching coelacanths as a bycatch. But it's quite remarkable uh, what these fishermen do. Uh, up until recently, they made their own lines uh, fishing to depths at 800 meters and uh, they made their um, their own floats and their sinkers and everything, and they were hauling in uh, quite remarkably large fish. And there, a more sophisticated version of the double outreach rigger with a latin sail. And these are not only used for fishing, but also for transporting passengers. And an even more elaborate one from Mafia Island uh, with a large sail, and this would mainly be for carrying goods. Now, uh, mangroves, um, because their roots and, and, and branches have come in in, in very nice angles, um, and, and because the wood is also very resistant to um, rotting in the sea, they're very valuable for making the components of um, boats, fishing boats. And there you can see uh, the various uses to which mangrove wood is used um, in making uh, fishing boats. And there's a more modern version with the deadly um, monofilament gill nets um, in Zanzibar. Now in Camores, they tried an experiment, the various foreign aid organizations, by making fiberglass uh, boats with inboard motors. And uh, these allowed the fishermen to go out much further and stay out longer. But the problem is they couldn't be launched over the rocky shore. They had to be launched from uh, cement slipways. And when the foreign aid uh, people left the country, and no one was uh, left behind that knew how to maintain them. So unfortunately, the carcasses of these Joppa was um, made in Japan, uh, litter the shore around um, the, uh, the Comores, and they've largely been replaced again by dugout canoes and crude outboard powered boats. Now, I haven't had a chance to mention all the unusual traditional fishing methods. Here are further examples. Fish parks in West Africa, which are basically enclosed areas where there's dense um, fish, um, sea grasses and which attract fish. Uh, gravity traps in Niger, Niger, in Niger. Uh, spring traps in Cameroon, falling door traps, vertical tiger fish screens that catch jumping tiger fish in Lake Shad. Bavenda lineless fishing rods where the bait is actually attached to the end of the rod itself. Uh, in Loango, the bell alarm rods, triangular luku gill nets, multiple pocket seine nets. So incredible innovation has been shown. But unfortunately, harmful fishing practices have also crept in. 
And we tend to call them modern. And the only th modern thing about them is the technology, the materials, uh, the chemistry behind them. They are by no means modern in terms of their impact on the fishery, uh, which is almost always negative. Of course, the most senseless way of fishing is blast fishing, uh, which destroys coral reefs and destroys habitat and is totally unsustainable. Poisoning with oil and other petrochemicals and also with insecticides is becoming increasingly popular. Uh, the use of mosquito nets, as I've mentioned, monofilament gill nets, illegal throw nets, uh, large gill nets and trawl nets, uh, for instance, in Madagascar, large mesh gill nets are used for catching sharks for the shark fin trade, which is a very wasteful industry because they just cut off the, the fins and then throw the rest of the shark back in the water. And these large mesh gill nets are now also catching turtles, uh, dugongs and coelacanths. And then massive trawl nets are being deployed illegally off, this, off the East African coast. Ghost fishing is a serious problem, as are swamp poaching and coral harvesting. And let me illustrate some of those. So there on the top is swamp hoeing, where a, a wetland is, is sort of enclosed uh, by a barrier of, of uh, raised sand. And it's, the entire thing is dug, dug up and, and basically destroyed as a habitat. The use of oil and modern insecticide show, pesticide shown on the left. Mosquito nets are uh, being used for fish traps, which don't allow any small fish fry uh, to escape because of the very fine mesh. And ghost fishing, uh, which takes place when fish gear is lost at sea, but continues to operate for decades. And, and, and in the case of uh, some of the modern plastics, probably for centuries. And some terrifying statistics have come out that the, the catch, the harvest from ghost fishing may now be higher than that of the commercial harvest of fishes in the sea. So effectively, we're catching double uh, what we think we're catching. Illegal gill net fishing as an example of uh, that activity on Lake Victoria. Illegal throw net fishing. The throw net uh, was not ever invented in, in, in Africa. It was an introduction and it's banned in most uh, countries for uh, commercial purposes. And here's an example of the kind of illegal uh, trawler that's deploying giant trawl nets um, and basically operated by pirates uh, off the northeast coast of Africa. Um, at Mtengani in Zanzibar, I witnessed the harvesting of coral rock um, on a massive scale, and this obviously is hugely harmful to inshore ecosystems, and they do this despite the fact that there are large reserves of fossil coral inland on, on, on Zanzibar that could potentially be used. So what's happening is it's a deadly pattern of we moving from traditional fishing methods to more um, so-called modern gear, such as multi-filament gill nets, which are relatively inefficient to ultra efficient monofilament gill nets, then to giant sains, trawl nets, poisons and explosives. And these are decimating resources. They're not using them uh, sustainably and local people are suffering. Now there's been a pattern in fisheries management uh, through the centuries, uh, traditional control, which allowed uh, sustainable harvesting, colonial control with a much more centralized uh, uh, model, uh, the opening up of new markets and trading patterns, which resulted in fish being caught in one place and exported and eaten in another. Attempts at co-management co between colonials and traditional uh, leaders. Um, but unfortunately, the pattern now, both in freshwaters and marine, is overfishing and destructive fishing, the deadly pattern that I've mentioned, and, and a dire future for traditional fishing. So what is that future? I think we need to recognize the long an ancestry and the value of the, uh, traditional fishing methods. Um, and we need to learn that conserving fishes is important, but what's equally important is conserving those methods that are used to catch them sustainably. That the traditional fishing methods are cultural heritage and their, their role in sustainable harvesting needs to be recognized. And a very interesting development in, in California and the USA is there they've introduced a law where crab traps have to have one face 
made out of biodegradable netting. So if the crab track is lost at sea, uh, the biodegradable netting uh, rots away and ghost fishing doesn't take place. And it's that sort of thinking that we need to adopt. So hybrid technologies are something we need to look at. We need to look at social justice and governance and knowing that one of the SDGs of the UN is to um, eliminate um, destructive fishing methods and restore um, fish stocks. Education, as always, is absolutely important, and we need to accept that part of biodiversity conservation is conserving uh, sustainable methods of harvesting. And talking about education, there's a wonderful project on Chumbi Island uh, where marine guides are, are being trained uh, to teach people about the importance of conservation. So that's what I have to offer you. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. The floor is now open for questions and answers, and um, you're welcome to use the reaction tools at the bottom of the screen, or you can also just wave at us or type a message in the chat. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and um, uh, hear Prof. Mike's answers on your questions. Mareka, you already look like you want to ask a question. <laughs> There are so many questions in the chat box. I'm reading through those and there's quite interesting ones. So I think you might want to have a look at that as well. Yes, yes. I saw we have a wonderful series of questions from Sitembisu. Um, I'm going to start with how do you deal with the threats towards the catfish, catfish such as irresponsible fishing, etc., since they are critically endangered? Sorry, what was he referring to? Catfish. Okay, by catfish, do you mean octopus? Um, Sitembiso, would you like to perhaps unmute and then you can, you can answer that because I don't want to speak for you in, uh, on behalf of you in terms of what you mean when you say that. Can I read his second question um, in the meantime? Secondly, doesn't the hooks that are used cause negative impacts such as injury, injuring them or causing psychological and physiological stress? Mm -hmm. Prof, you want to have a go at that one? Okay, is he referring to bony fish or to invertebrates? Uh, it's a very broad question. Yeah, you know, this is something we tend to ignore. We tend to only look at the mortalities that are arising from um, unsustainable fishing methods, but there's also a lot of secondary damage that's done uh, through st stress and damage to fish that aren't killed and then die later. Um, and yeah, you know, what we found, for instance, and in I work in the Okavango, is there are a lot of fish there that are diseased and parasitized as a result of being injured. And so they didn't die at the time they were injured, but they die later from, from problems with parasitism. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so then a, 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 another question in that series of questions: the plants that are used in uh, used to poison the fish, doesn't it impact other species that consumes it instead of the fish during um, the interim period that it's effective? Okay, so it depends on which poison one's talking about. Some of them are neurotoxins, which can affect um, other uh, species, including invertebrates. And um, some of them are hematoxins, but you know, in, in general, those those natural um, poisons don't have don't kill a wide range of organisms. Whereas some of the the more recent um, uh, poisons that have been developed, and and for instance, we did a study in the Okavango of the impact of endosulfan and and DDT spraying for tsetse fly. And it, it was absolutely deadly. It was sort of a silent spring all over again, where not only aquatic um, organisms were being killed, but even terrestrial insects that, you know, settle on the water or, or um, drink the water or something. So, you know, the once again, those traditional methods, they've been using them for centuries. They don't want them to kill the fish food. They don't want them to kill the fish that haven't bred yet. So they tend to select the poisons um, that are biodegradable and are, are targeted at just a few species. Okay, and then a final question re regarding legal aspects. 
Um, are there any regulations, and I, and I guess this is once again very broad, um, any regulations regarding how many fish can be caught on a day and how wide and deep the net, the net should be um, used? Um, yep. Yeah, you know, obviously bag limits are a very important part of any uh, fishery policy. The problem is not promulgating them. The problem is implementing them and controlling uh, you know, regulating the fishery in such a way that you know that bag limits are not uh, being uh, abused. And, and the only way to overcome that problem is to get the fishermen to understand themselves why those bag limits need to be implemented so that they themselves are the enforcers. And a, a wonderful success story that we've had in the Comores, especially at Grand Comore, is previously, um, you know, Sealer Council caught as a bycatch, and then they, they were found to have value because museums would buy them and a fisherman could sell them for the equivalent of three or four years income for one fish. So naturally they, you know, they sold them. Then the coelacanth became protected and now it's regarded as a sacred fish. So the strongest and most motivated conservers of the coelacanth in Grand Comor are now the fishermen themselves. Um, it's regarded, you know, through their religion as a sacred fish that may not be harvested and of course is protected by international legislation. So, um, you know, that has been a, a great example of how um, bottom-up conservation really works. So it's, it can't only be, conservation cannot only be implemented by creating the regulations. It's got to be something that becomes part of the mindset um, of the fishermen. Right. And that's the approach that uh, people in, in Madagascar, uh, Andrew Cook and others are, are implementing, you know, teaching the fishermen why it's necessary to have bag limits, to have uh, seasons when you're not allowed to catch fish and um, size limits, etc. Thank Sorry you, Professor. Prof. Um, can we ask Asima, because it's actually Asima who's um, asking the questions on Isn Tim Busso's um, question, if we can unmute them and let them just ask that question, the first one. Asima, are you unmuted? Uh, yeah, I'm unmuted. Thank you. Awesome. Um, hi, this is Asima Ali. I'm a founder. I'm from TUT, a senior student, basically. I'm doing my second year. So um, basically the question that I'm asking there, right, when I'm referring to the catfish, right, I'm referring to um, the invertebrates. So you know that um, obviously there's a lot of things that uh, contribute towards the water, for example, pollution, and some, obviously some fishermen also do like um, irresponsible uh, fishing and all this kind of things. And as we know, some fishes are kind of uh, particularly endangered. So basically if we do not, what can I say, regulate this traditional, um, fishing thing, um, it might lead to them actually being extinct. So, like, what do you actually do about that? Yeah, uh, you know, I think the octopus is a very important example of an animal that we need to take a very good look at. Uh, it's been found recently that they are probably the most intelligent invertebrates, and there, there are campaigns internationally for animal rights to be, um, you know, allowed for uh, octopus because it seems that they can uh, you know feel pain they can anticipate pain they can exp express stress uh, and so on and um, you know the my octopus teacher form showed us just how intelligent these animals are they are definitely over harvested but fortunately you know for instance um, off Zanzibar where I've had a good look at them they're completely over harvested in the shallow uh, intertidal zone, but deeper down, uh, they're abundant. Um, and deeper down, you'll find sharks. So the fishermen and the divers are, are reluctant to go there. But in other places where you don't have that deeper water sort of sanctuary, uh, octopus have been absolutely decimated. Um, and, you know, they're an extremely important part of the ecosystem. They're important animals in their own rights. And I think we need to give a great deal more attention to octopus uh, conservation. And I think in some circumstances, they should um, be totally protected and should not allow, uh, the, uh, fishermen should not be allowed to harvest them at all. Okay, I'm going to move on to Brian. Brian Yuvar, please uh, ask your question. 
Oh, hey guys, thanks. That was really interesting talk, you know, kind of thinking of these African fisheries as social ecological systems and, and the value of preserving these. So thanks a lot. That was really insightful. I really enjoyed it. But I, I kept thinking of these kind of much bigger knot of incentives or perverse incentives that may change these artisanal fishing methods. So kind of a, I don't know, like a political ecology approach to thinking of domestic use of fish as population grows or, or spatial population shifts to coastal areas or increasing urbanization or other kind of market drivers that may kind of force people's hands, right? There may be some sort of very powerful economic incentives for people to harvest and sell fish. So I wonder what your thoughts are on that. And maybe it's kind of the 800 pound gorilla in the room that's just impossible to ignore, but hard to fix. And the second part of the question would be in the face of those huge pressures to harvest more fish to feed people or create livelihoods. What what are your thoughts on aquaculture? And I say that not as a lobbyist or a promoter of aquaculture. I'm I'm South African, but I'm based here in Canada. And you know, we're 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 having a sort of a sober second thought on on a lot of hatchery driven solutions, be they for food or recreation. But I'd be interested to hear your thoughts because they come obviously with their own suite of costs as well. Thanks. Yeah, in, in terms of political systems, I mean, the fact is that those African countries which have rich aquatic resources in terms of rivers and lakes and wetlands, etc., most of the freshwater fishes are actually the staple diet of the of the local people. So they're incredibly important in terms of the quality of life of people. So, you know, that is incentive enough to, to make sure that they sustainably use. A very interesting uh, thing that's happened recently is the COVID uh, pandemic revealed the extent of the bushmeat trade from Africa to China and other uh, Far Eastern countries. And uh, this also opened the way for various international agencies to clamp down on the bushmeat trade at various stages of the supply chain. But they realized that by doing that, they were... Um, taking the livelihood away from rural African people who hunted bushmeat in order to supply that trade. And a, a research has been done by various aid organizations to see, you know, how can we provide alternative means of income for these bushmeat hunters? And now that, you know, they can't sell their, 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 their uh, products anymore. And um, Artisanal fishing and also aquaculture, as well as beekeeping and various forms of uh, small-scale animal husbandry, have all are all now being pursued and funded by aid agencies. And in particular, aquaculture uh, has come to the fore. I'm a great supporter of aquaculture. I think it's a you know a way of intensely uh, producing uh, fish with minimum uh, sort of carbon footprint in terms of the operation and taking the um, the threat away from, from the wild stocks and even the opportunity to replenish uh, wild stocks under certain circumstances. And we have some of the best aquaculture fish species in the world here, uh, which is shown by the fact that many of them have been exported and are, are cultured successfully elsewhere in the world. So, you know, I, I think it's something great, but, you know, the thing about aquaculture is you've got to have kind of blue fingers. You've got to be someone who naturally knows how to grow aquatic animals. And knowing how to grow crops on land, having green fingers is not good enough. And, and this is something we've struggled with a bit in that in a lot of cases, we've worked out the technology for growing fishes under aquaculture conditions, but we haven't found the people. Uh, you've got the patience and resilience and, and, and the skill set to, to make uh, take those fish to the market in, in the long term. So, um, you know, I'm very much in favor of, of, of aquaculture. I think it could be the savior for, for Africa in terms of providing uh, fresh protein, especially in rural areas, but also generating income for selling plate fish, uh, you know, in urban areas. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for that question. Um, Asima, I will return to your question in a moment. I just want to go to Jamila's question quickly. We, uh, we have learned that tourism doesn't always work, especially during the pandemic, where travel wasn't allowed. How do we support these traditional fish, fishing methods when 
newer technologies that are more efficient seems viable for the communities? Well, they may be more efficient in the short term, but in the medium and long term, they're not more efficient because they decimate the resource. And they also cause the resource to change uh, in that, you know, a larger um, fish which breed at a larger size are replaced by weedy um, fish that's breed at a smaller size who can replace themselves very quickly. So we're not only depleting the original fish stock, we're actually changing the nature of the whole uh, fish community. Um, yeah, I don't think we can depend too much on tourism to, to you know, conserve uh, traditional fishing methods, but I do think there are a few examples where they uh, could play a key role. Uh, for instance, uh, in the Fonya fishery in the Pongola River, and even the barricade fishery um, at, at, up at Cozy Bay, which is a real tourist attraction, but you know people don't pay anything to see it, and, and they should be charged. And it's interesting that those same barricade traps that now occur at Cozy previously occurred also in Richards Bay and even Durban Bay uh, centuries ago. And maybe we should think, think of restoring them, at least in, in the Richards Bay area. Hmm. Okay, so um, Asima's question, with regards to the law, what happens to those who actually are caught or don't oblige? Um, yeah, that's just linking to the previous question. question. Yeah, you know, the problem with uh, implementing um, conservation measures in, in aquatic ecosystems is a lot of these fisheries are in very remote areas where the law is not well represented and it's very difficult um, to, to apprehend people and uh, take them to trial and, and you know, punish them. So, you know, that's why I say the, 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 uh, the law has got to come from within the local people themselves, from within the policemen. And, the, and I know in Botswana, for instance, where they've had the problem in the upper swamp and also Lake Ngami, where, um, Fishermen from to the north, uh, from Angola and 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 Zambia, come in and they, you know, they destroy the, the resource and then they go back and fish somewhere else. This is now being uh, patrolled by the local uh, and dunas and 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 chiefs uh, in order to prevent them. So looking after their own resources is is one of the key ways. Uh, we can't rely too much on the sort of formal legal and policing system, although that that you know is very important where they have sufficient presence on the ground. I see that um, Asima has got a future in the green scorpions. Uh, also, a very sharp second uh, question there: the airplane fuel with a wing, the airplane fuel wing, which was used to make the boat instead of trees, does it not have any toxic effect? that may affect the water and then eventually affecting the species in the water. Yeah, I think that might have been the case right at the beginning uh, if the fishermen didn't clean it out properly, but that was a fuel tank from a jet fighter. Um, but I think he would have, uh, you know, being a fisherman who's concerned about uh, sustainably using his resource, he would have given it, good, given it a good clean out before uh, he used it. Uh, but, but I don't think it would have had a long-term impact. I must say, I would hate to have gone out in that um, that uh, canoe in, in hippo-infested waters. It looks very unstable to me. Indeed. Um, several I comments. Sibyl Ridmiller had a question, I think. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to find, because she made, um, Sibyl made several interesting comments. Um, I'm going to read them all. I'm going to try and find them all. Um, it is our experience over 30 years that small-scale fisheries, fisheries cooperate with marine parks when educated about and learning by evidence that strictly enforced no-take zones have a spillover effect that increases their harvests in, ad in adjacent fishing grounds. Prof, you want to comment on that? Well, uh, uh, research of a lot of people, including Colin Buxton um, in the Titicama Coastal National Park, just shows how important um, marine reserves are 
in restocking um, adjacent areas. They have a proven importance. And in West Africa, I know from the, um, the enclosures, the very simple enclosures they make with reed fences, and then they plant seagrass inside. The fish populations grow very rapidly, but all, the adjacent um, areas also uh, you know, get more abundant fish as a result of the benefits uh, from those uh, seagrass beds. So, yeah, you know, we need to realize that fishes can respond very quickly to suitable environmental conditions and 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 sensible um, harvesting levels. And uh, in particular, wetland fishes, um, incredibly resilient and uh, have an unbelievable ability to bounce back because they, they live in an environment where the only permanent thing is change. So they're able to adapt to change. So, you know, we need to use that resilience um, um, to our advantage and to their advantage. Um, Sabel, I see your video is on. Can can we unmute you and you can join the conversation? Yes, I think uh, wonderful to see you, Mike. <laughs> Hello, Sybil. Yeah, Great to see you again. And I'm glad yeah. I was able to mention Chumbi Island and the education program that you started there. Yes, thank you so much. I mean, I... I was totally impressed by your presentation and these wonderful photos. The only little thing I disagree now, because we just mentioned this, is uh, fiberglass boats. They do produce massive microplastic and nanoplastic once they are discarded or even continuously. Uh, that's what I learned in a, a big uh, workshop last week uh, of uh, experts on uh, marine pollution. Fiberglass boats are contributing to marine pollution, and that's not being addressed at all. So that's the only point I would like to so clarify, what, otherwise, yeah. What exactly did you disagree with? The, <clears throat> the effect of fiberglass boats uh, on, uh, uh, I mean, they do produce microplastic and nanoplastic uh, throughout, and especially once they are discarded, like the ones you showed in the Comores, which are uh, uh, take our rocky, I mean, uh, grounds and discarded. It seems to be a huge problem in Europe, in the Mediterranean, uh, discarded fiberglass boats in the US, in the global north. I don't have any figures at hand, but the experts on marine pollution uh, kind of pointed at fiberglass boats being a huge threat to marine pollution. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree that we, the more we learn about uh, plastics, the more horrific it becomes, because we now know that most plastic don't decompose in the way that uh, organic materials decompose, they just form smaller and smaller little plastic particles. And those pl plastic particles um, get into the gills, they get into the digestive tracts, they get into the tissues of, of marine um, animals of all kinds. So, uh, you know, they, they, they pollute at all sorts of different levels when they, uh, in the for original product, but especially when they degraded down into tiny little plastic um, particles. That is what's really going to cause the damage in the long term. And these plastic particles have been found in marine sediments uh, through quite considerable depths already. So they, you know, we're doing a great deal of harm uh, through the use of plastic. And of course, um, the some kind of plastics are they specially designed by industrial chemists to not degrade. And those are the ones that are going to last the longest and have the most devastating impact. And they, of course, accumulated up through the food chain, uh, which makes it even worse. Thanks, Prof. Thanks, Sibyl. Um, Marty, please go ahead. So thanks very much, uh, Prof. Bruton, for your talk. I, I'm just quite intrigued. There's a almost a, a big difference between the freshwater fish versus the saltwater fish and the oceans versus the rivers. And I think, um, yeah, just w which are which are more threatened? I know the sort of <clears throat> ocean fisheries are threatened by international um, fisheries, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but I think the, the, the river fishing is, is mainly from, uh, you know, indigenous people. And I think it, it probably is exacerbated by just the numbers of people that are fishing. Or um, maybe if you can just talk about the, the, the two, um, where, where are the biggest threats in, in the two different types of fishing areas? 
Well, you know, looking at it very holistically, one of the biggest threats to freshwater environments is physical changes, habitat changes, and the changes caused by global uh, climate change and um, pollution, where these environments are may being made less habitable by, by the aquatic fauna. And in some cases, you know, entire wetlands have dried up due to, um, you know, the incorrect use of water resources. Whereas on the marine coast, you know, what we need to remember is that the sea isn't um, sort of as productive right across its full expanse and its full volume um, as it is around the coast. Uh, in fact, the open ocean is equivalent to a semi-arid desert in terms of its organic productivity, whereas uh, coral reefs and mangrove swamps and, and some rocky reefs are, are highly productive systems, but they're just a very narrow um, edge around the ocean, so which doesn't extend very far out. So, you know, the unfortunate thing is that the most productive marine environments are those that are most accessible to humans. And, and, and those are the ones that we're decimating, and they're the kind of engine room of the oceans. And as we know, all major ecological processes on land originate over the oceans. So we're really cutting our own throats by, by harming the most productive edge uh, of the oceans. So the problems are different. Um, and, you know, but something we need to realize is that climate change is going to have a massive impact especially with the shifting biogeographical zones, changing rainfall patterns, um, and the increased severity of um, extreme weather events. So, you know, we're going to have very wet, very dry, very hot, very cold um, extremes much more often than we've had in the past. And um, that's going to have a big impact on, on relatively shallow freshwater ecosystems, but also on the shallow edge of the sea. And then just another question, are there, I mean, in a similar way to which you have marine protected areas on the coastlines, do we have similar sort of um, protective uh, things set up for the, the rivers? Well, rivers are very difficult to conserve, uh, you know, and, and fishes are very difficult to fence in. Um, and the Okavango Delta, which is a nicely defined system, is a World Heritage Site. Um, and, it, it, you know, that gives it some protection. And there are many examples of freshwater um, uh, reserves around the world, but the most difficult systems to conserve on the aquatic side are, in fact, rivers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we must remember that the river is the, the center uh, of, of a, a, a whole catchment. We tend to put international boundaries along rivers, and that's a bit of a disaster. Uh, international boundaries should rather be along the, the, the tops of mountains, you know, that define the edge from one catchment to another. So we have a lot of international disputes where one country, you know, has is implementing strict conservation measures in a river, and their country on the other side of the river is not, and, and therefore the resource gets depleted anyway. Thanks very much. Thanks, Prof. Um, so there's another question that came through from Asima. Um, Asima, would you like to unmute? Can, can Maret, is she available? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Go for it. Okay, so basically, uh, there was this other fishing method where I saw it's a whole entire gathering of people where they come together and they do a whole lot of fishing too together. So since uh, you said that there's crocodiles and there's leeches also in the water, isn't it a bit like life threatening towards those people? So like it would have a negative impact because they might be injured or even get killed by the, um, the crocodiles, as we know that uh, nowadays the cases, majority of them are usually done by those crocodiles. So would you actually uh, motivate it or say you encourage it to actually continue uh, it being done, even though you know that it's life threatening towards the people? Well, yeah, I, I'm not sure if you're referring to this tourism suggestion I made. Tourism's love adrenaline sports. They love doing dangerous things. Um, 
And I think some of them would get quite a kick about uh, wading around in crocodile infested waters. But yeah, we did research at Lake Sabaya for, um, I was there for uh, five and a half years. I spent uh, probably a thousand hours underwater using scuba in a, a lake that had crocodiles and hippos. You get to know their behavior. You need to, you get to know when they're active, when you, you are, are more vulnerable and you get to know how to live with them. And the people who live on the Pongola floodplain have been doing that for centuries. So, you know, they, they've learned how to do these uh, fonia drives in the presence of large um, tiger fish and leeches and crocodiles and hippos. And um, there are occasional injuries, but in general, everyone gets on with one another. In fact, the biggest hazard in, on the, on the, uh, the fonia drives that I took part in is putting your, your hand into the fonia basket and trying to grab the fish including tiger fish and, and leeches and, 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 and um, squeaker catfish with, with sharp spines that they lock in place. You, you get much more damage taking the fish out of the basket than you do in wading around the swamp. Hmm. I think therein lies the, the almost the value of this traditional knowledge also, learning to live with these large um, mammals and coexisting peacefully. Um, and that's unfortunately something that 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 we're losing. Yeah. Um, that and that's part of the whole traditional fishing um, community. Yeah. The, the you know the oral traditions that are passed down that the incredible knowledge and understanding and empathy uh, with wildlife is, is something that's extremely important and and which we're losing and we're undervaluing it. And although you know South Africa has now now has several centres of excellence in indigenous knowledge and they're doing a terrific job, I don't think it give, gets enough uh, media attention. I don't think it gets enough attention in our education systems, just how valuable um, indigenous knowledge is. Hmm. Um, I feel we will have to invite somebody to to do a talk on that for us. Um, I know we've we've had some, but we we might need to dive deeper into that topic. Marty, did I um, miss any questions in the chat? Um, Marit, please help. I think there are a couple others. If I can quickly just ask, some uh, kind of link to the the last question. Um, just traditionally, with the I think you called it the Fumba, Fumba Drive. Oh, um, Fonia, did, yeah. Fonia. Did, did they do? Did they do that sort of kind of once a year, and then they caught a whole lot of fish, or was it a all year round um, kind of thing with eight hundred people that were doing it? Because yeah, I mean, just the, the the impact I would have thought on the species, or was it only at a particular time when they were in abundance? Now, the very big Fonia drives only took place once a year, but once again, they they have such an intimate knowledge of the the seasonal patterns of abundance. And remember, this was before the Pongola Port Dam was put up and blocked the river flow and, and changed the seasonality of the floods. Uh, you know, when the floods were occurring naturally, um, they would harvest on a low, um, low level throughout the year. But when the floodplain started to dry up and the waters were receding and the individual pans became isolated from the river, that's when they did their big drives because they knew that those fish were going to die anyway in the drying up pan or, or you know, be heavily predated on by uh, natural predators. So, you know, they kind of fitted into the natural cycle of, of um, spawning and bre breeding and spawning and growth and then mortality um, by timing their uh, fonia drives to a, a time when the fishes were going to die anyway. And, and just the number of people, um, sort of the, the r r rising um, people numbers, uh, is that part of the problem in your mind or um, is, is that not really a factor? No, it's just that in those days, the Fonia baskets were their main method of catching fish. Nowadays, they can catch them much more quickly and efficiently using gill nets, uh, monofilament gill nets and, and um, say nets made out of synthetic fibers, etc. So there's no need to go through the labor and the danger of a fonia drive. You can, you can just deploy the so-called modern gear uh, and catch the fish as you need. 
And the other thing that's happened is that traders who, who you know, come and buy the fish and then sell them elsewhere are bringing these nets in and, and, and harvesting um, systems to extinction and then moving on to the next place. Uh, and they don't care what happens to the resource because they have no long-term vested interest in it. No, thanks. Uh, uh, there, there was a, a comment about, um, or a question about uh, quite common um, active method is missing in the dynamite fishing, uh, which is, seems to be common in Tanzania. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, please. No, well, that I mentioned under the title blast fishing, and yeah. you know, blast fishing is is absolutely deadly. It's been carried out in Tanzania. It's been carried out in uh, the Comores. Fortunately, uh, it's been controlled uh, and very strictly regulated in Madagascar. So, according to my contacts, there it's not uh, happening there, despite their very long coastline. Um, I've heard of incidents in, in Mozambique and also Kenya, but um, Sybil can tell us more, but I, I think the biggest problem is in fact um, in Tanzania and the Comores. But and, the, the, and you know, the sad thing is that in, you, can, you can look up um, recipes for explosives on the internet now, and you can make them out of products that you can buy at the, the local agricultural dealer. Fertilizers and various other ingredients. Okay, no thanks. I, I just thought if you could elaborate on that because that was one of the questions that had that come up. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Hans Fricker, the famous German diver scientist who brought the Jago and um, submersible to the Comores for coelacanth research. During his last dives there, he told me that they would be down at three or four hundred meters and they would hear these underwater bombs going off above them um, mm. off, off the south coast of Grand Comore. It's an absolutely tragic thing that's been happening. And it's something that, that to me, it seems it should be a, a, a controllable, uh, but it's it's not under control. Uh, also, another contentious um, thing that was going on was all that, um, uh, I think prospecting with um, those blasts um, all, all around the coast for, I think, for, for by shell for fracking and that kind of stuff, um, the, the effect that has on the marine population was also quite a... Yeah, well, you know, when I was asked for my opinion on, on the exploration of the Trans Sky Coast, I made the point that, uh, you know, we don't rely a lot on hearing and, and vibration in, in our life, but underwater, vibrations are extremely important and are amplified and uh, you know the vibration from a large blast can be uh, felt by animals with lateral lines kilometers away and uh, you know so you know we need to think in terms of the sense organs of, of aquatic animals when we deal with issues like that not our own sense organs. Well, thanks. Um, Johan, I'm not sure if you've picked up any other ones that I may have missed. I think I've covered the the, the ones at the earlier part. <laughs> sure, there was a, a comment and question from, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this correctly, Disan or Dyson Kikomeko. Um, forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Um, thanks, Prof, for the beautiful presentation and most importantly for the nice photos. Can this be published for a lot of research to benchmark um, on the various methods? So I think right at the beginning, you mentioned that you published a book on this topic. So maybe if you can just repeat the... Um... Yeah, the book is called Traditional Fishing Methods of Africa. It's published by Cambridge University Press. And it was in fact, um, yeah, it was part of their Indigenous um, Knowledge Library series. I published some additional um, popular articles on the topic, and in the, in the uh, in my traditional fishing methods, I also have a, quite a comprehensive reference list of other publications on African traditional fishing methods. But it's an amazing it's amazing to me how little has been published in that field. The last attempt at a comprehensive coverage was over fifty years ago. Um, then there was a final question that I'm going to take from um, Asima. Um, and that was just, it, are those traditional fishing methods, and I think she referred to those in North KwaZulu-Natal, 
um, around Cozy Bay? Are they focused on specific um, species of fish and do they catch shark um, indiscriminately perhaps as well? No, they, they tend to catch a very specific fish and no, and and that's a beautifully designed um, uh, barricade fish trap system because there's a channel down the middle of it that you're not allowed to put traps across, which allows the normal um, migrations of fish uh, to take place. And also the, the gaps in the barricades are such that all fish that are smaller than breeding size can escape and are not caught. And uh, the fish, um, as far as possible, tend to get caught after the breeding season. Um, but something you know worrying is starting to happen now. We see plastic um, netting being put um, uh, next to the fences, which of course means that more fishes are being caught. Um, and you know it is so important that those traditional fish traps continue to be used in the traditional way. Um, I remember meeting a fisherman there and he showed me exactly how he used his finger, uh, you know, to determine the gap between the reeds and he would absolutely not make the traps with a smaller gap because he realized how important that was and just getting that knowledge passed on is, is so important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me that should be regarded as a, a, a national treasure. Uh, those barricade fish traps, um, they should have the same, you know, conservation value as, as a marine reserve, and and maybe that we should have a sort of CITES equivalent for for a culturally significant um, um, methods of, of harvesting uh, sustainably. Thank you, Prof. Um, I think we're going to conclude with that. It's almost nine o'clock already. Um, so thank you for a wonderful presentation and a super interesting Q&A. And thank you to everybody who asked questions and participated. It is wonderful. We learn together. Um, and we hope to see you again next week when we will be hosting the team from um, Sambra. So wonderful to see all of you and it will be great to see you again next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.